and welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our uh, viewers who are online watching the live webcast. It'll be available after, uh, after the presentation uh, at CSIS.org. But thank you for coming here this morning. Uh, my name is Scott Miller. I'm the uh, Senior Advisor and William M. Scholl Chair in International Business here at CSIS. Today's topic is the disappointing performance of global trade since the 2008-2009 financial crisis. We're going to look at what caused it and what should be done about it. The report we're releasing today uh, is, and today's conference is uh, uh, thanks to the generous sponsorship of BHP Billiton, the global resources company headquartered in Melbourne, Australia. To begin today's event, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andrew McKenzie, Chief Executive Officer of BHP Billiton. Andrew has over 30 years' experience in the oil, gas, chemicals, and minerals business. He joined BHP Billiton in November 2008. Uh, for those of you who have memories of that, that's actually pretty good timing to get the base right. Uh, but but uh, the, uh, in any case, he became CEO of BHP Billiton in May of 2013. He's in Washington for just a few days, and we're delighted he could join us this morning. Beyond Andrew's responsibilities at BHP Billiton, he is very active in the public policy arena. Uh, most recently, he was a member of the Business 20 Australian leadership team uh, during Australia's G20 host year of 2014. It's my great pleasure to welcome Andrew. Okay, well, thank you, Scott. Um, look, it, it is actually a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I've found since becoming CEO and some of the things I've been co-opted into is that I, I, I kind of feel naturally that I want to be a champion of free trade. And, uh, and, and a lot of my meetings while I'm here in Washington this week are very much designed with that in mind. Uh, this is actually quite a, an interesting day, you know, to launch a, a topic such as what prompted the global trade slow down because it was seven years ago when we woke up to the uh, news of the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and while, of course, most people talk about the impact on that blowout on banking uh, and monetary policy, actually, in some ways, the effect on free trade uh, has been overlooked and has been very significant because it's had a very negative effect on free trade. I'm going to be talking tomorrow to the American Chamber of Commerce and, and actually construct what I think is a reasonably plausible hypothesis that the combination of the rise of China and, and, and effectively the event that was brought to a, uh, the fore by the Lehman Brothers collapse ha has actually been very detrimental uh, to free trade and in many ways has resulted in a lot of policy developments which have actually been almost antithetical to what they should have done uh, in trying to promote global growth because they've ended up actually through protectionism reducing global growth. So, um, you know, as, as Scott mentioned, you know, uh, I've had a long career, principally, uh, you know, in science and natural resources, you know, and so you could wonder, well, why does that lead you to be such a proponent of free trade? Uh, well, I think the, the, the natural resource piece is fairly obvious, that, you know, that we do depend on the free movement, you know, of a lot of our resources, we actually strongly believe that the free trade in resources uh, and actually the removal of all cartels from, from resources trade is tremendous for global growth, but it actually means that resources, financial resources get to the development of those resources, which actually are, are lowest cost and ultimately reduce those costs. You say, I, I shouldn't be advocating for low prices, but I do because I think it actually promotes global growth. And we as a company believe that we will flourish the most in that sector because of our, uh, uh, the quality of our resources, but most importantly and increasingly, our, our, our emphasis on operational excellence, which actually means that we can actually make lots of money even when resource prices are quite cheap. But, but actually, the other side of it, as I think the free movement of ideas and of people uh, 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 and so on are just as critical. And I'm a very strong believer that science and technology flourishes if IP, intellectual property, and those ideas move much more freely than are locked away for the use of a very small number of people. So they matter a lot to us in BHP Bulletin. We monitor trade very closely because uh, the resources that we use, are, we, 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 we produce, they're used in every sector in the economy in many ways, but predominantly we look at steel making, we look at what that leads to in infrastructure and in property machinery, 
course, we're in oil, gas, coal, uranium, so we help power the world. And, and increasingly, we invest more and more in copper because we do see a world that is moving towards a more renewable source of energy, a more efficient source of energy. And, and paradoxically, that is actually going to require an awful lot more copper because it is still the world's best conductor of electricity that can be delivered at a relatively low cost. So we see through all of those flows what, tra what higher trade barriers mean and what the impact that has on the growth of our business, but also the growth of our, of our, of our, of our customers' businesses, and also the ability of consumers to actually use resources to improve their quality of life and to reduce, in many cases, their environmental footprint. So it's pretty clear to us that protection slows the change where it's needed and that developed economies require real structural reform to push against that. You know, and China as well is going to have to rebalance its growth and this is going on at the moment. There's a lot of commentary about it. I mean, there are ups and downs in China that we can read about and we can hear about. The short-term volatility is extreme. You know, but, in the, but, but by and large, what's happening in China is something that we've foreseen for some time that the, the percentage rate of growth will slow, and it will slow as a result of movement steadily towards a more, it becoming a more developed economy. Uh, and as a result of that, it will consume uh, you know, more and more of our resources, but it's growth in demand for those resources, uh, in, in, at least in, in, in percentage terms will fall, although in absolute terms, that percentage is off a very high base. And so we have a lot to do. You know, but, all, but China and other emerging economies are going to need very open markets if they are going to become more prosperous. And I would argue if they are going to move through, in many cases, the middle income trap, which is to get through a GDP per head of around about $10,000 per person. Um, next week, we're also going to see uh, the announcement of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, by the United Nations. And these are very ambitious. They fit very much with many of our uh, values and the goals that we have as a company and how we feel we derive progress through what we produce. Uh, but I would say, you would expect that anyway, that they are not going to be possible without a real champion of free trade that promotes innovation, competition and efficiency. And, and, and that's why I've been drawn so powerfully into this and I did work with G20 last year uh, um, when it was in Australia. I'm doing a little bit less this year because of uh, Turkey and we have less connection with Turkey, but next year it's going to be in China and I think we will very much rejoin the fight then. And that's partly why we've asked Scott and Dean to write this paper, really explaining the underlying causes of the problem of, of, of global trade uh, slowdown, as, the, as, as the, the slide says. I think you'll find that the paper provides uh, some tremendous insight into the major trends. Uh, it will show how the quarter century before this crisis, you know, exacerbated by what happened, you know, seven years ago, you know, saw, uh, you know, poverty fall at, at a record rate. And during that time, you know, before we started to slow things down, trade grew almost twice as fast as output. And I think there is a first order relationship between them, you know, uh, you know and the cost of trade, of course, partly because of the things that we've done and, and other companies have done, you know, from freight to finance and communication fell to record lows. But it also shows that since the crisis, when things have gone backward, we've seen nearly a thousand new protectionist measures from G20 countries. They kind of disguise this a bit because, you know, official trade barriers, you know, through tariffs and so on, you know, have been less evident. It's been the kind of non-tariff barriers that have been, have, been, have been the most cynical and in many ways, and we've seen them all around the world. In many ways, they've affected products uh, further down the value chain than ours uh, to a greater extent than, our, uh, than ours, but we have seen it. And therefore, trade has slowed. You know, and I think more recently, the, the numbers have been even more depressing. And, and I, it's not surprising that the forecasts for economic growth have fallen with it. You know, I mean, there are other causes, of course, but I think, I, I think protectionism is definitely a first-order cause of the slowing of, uh, of projections for economic growth and the economic growth that we've realized. Um, so what needs to change? Well, of course, the US has and is showing great leadership. I mean, the, 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 the reinvigorated global free trade agenda that could come through the Trans-Pacific Partnership and through uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TPP and TTIP, uh, it, I think could be, would be very welcome. 
and they could very much help turn the tide, so we're very much behind that, and I will be promoting that very strongly while I'm here this week. I, I, I strongly, you know, to some extent, disagree with some aspects in the way that TP is, TPP is sold. I mean, it, it shouldn't be seen primarily as a security initiative. It should be seen as a trade initiative, and it should be seen as something that ultimately can embrace all countries around the Pacific and, 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 and draw in China, India, and, and Indonesia, which really are uh, so important to our future, and they will house over a third of the world's population by 2030. And I think so many things are happening, I don't have time to get into the politics of Europe and so on, but, but, I, but I, I, I believe the circum-Pacific region will be the driver of world's progress in a much more fundamental way than people can realize over the next 50 years. And that locomotive needs, needs caring for, and, and, and the US leadership in this respect, and hands across the Pacific, even to small countries like Australia, are going to be very critical uh, for the whole world, not just, I think, for the US, but for the whole world. Uh, I mean, in the meantime, while we kind of move things forward, you know, I think more does need to be done uh, while these multilateral deals are under discussion. I mean, clearly we hope ultimately on the other, on one side, it will reinvigorate some of the uh, WTO process, but it is more important than ever that the that, that, that countries lead by example, you know, and, and do things unilaterally. And when we were at G20, we said, look, you don't have to wait to agree things between each other. There's so much that you can do, you know, by just, you know, cutting red tape, streamlining and automating customs procedure, adopt the reforms, you know, from the Bali Trade Facilitation Agreement, and continue to invest and ease uh, infrastructure bottlenecks. And, and, and to some extent, we're starting to see this, or at least talked about, you know, more powerfully coming from countries like China and India, maybe less so with, with Indonesia, but when you think about some of the advocacy that's going on about One Belt, One Road coming out of China, that's an example of that. And, and, and certainly privately, I mean, he's struggling to deal with some of the things politically. Modi sees real value in investing in import-export infrastructure, even when he talks to someone like me, saying that might be better for them to bring iron ore into the country rather than deal with the, the incredibly difficult issues of a highly populous country which really doesn't want to be relocated so they can dig up a bit of their own local dirt. So when we made a lot of these recommendations at the G20, we estimated just... Just by, just by countries acting on their own within the G20 area and dealing with these, uh, if you like, non-tariff protectionist barriers, you know, we, could, we could generate up to three to four trillion dollars in, in GDP growth and, and easily another 50 million jobs across just the G20 group, which we at the time sort of used the headline, it was like adding another Germany to the global economy. So I think the benefits are huge, obviously, and that's why I hope this report uh, will inform policymakers and business people globally, prompt the change that we need, and I'm very confident it will make a significant contribution to the debate. So I can stay for a little bit, but, but, uh, but thank you for listening to me, and now it's, uh, it's our turn to listen to Scott. So over to you, Scott. Oops. Thank you, Andrew. Just get my pen. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. A great, uh, great way to launch this morning. Uh, and I really appreciate your passion on the issue. Uh, as I said earlier at the opening, many observers have noticed that the global trade performance since the 2008-2009 financial crisis has been quite disappointing. There was a collapse, of course, in 2009 when, when overall demand collapsed, and some recovery, a rebound in 2010. But since that time, Global trade has only grown at about 3.4% a year versus 7% a year in the previous uh, pre-crisis period. To get an idea of what this looks like, uh, uh, we, we, we uh, showed pretty clearly the pre and post here, but let me explain what's going on in this chart. This is, a, uh, this is world trade as a share of global output. The way to think about this chart is if world trade had only grown as fast as global output, in any given year, the graph, the line will be horizontal. 
So what you can see is when the line is ascending, that's a, that's a period of time in which trade is growing faster than global output. You can see the dip in 2009 where trade slowed actually more dramatically than output, and it's rebounded, and, and we've, re we've reached that flat spot where global trade, post-crisis global trade, is growing only about as fast as global output. Now, what's remarkable about this chart is the 25 years that preceded the crisis. It is really unusual in uh, world history for trade to grow that fast for that long. Literally, we went trade, merchandise trade went from 23% of global output in 1982 to 44% of global output in 2007 as output grew pretty uh, robustly. So quite a remarkable period uh, with trade grains roughly twice as fast as output throughout that period. Post-crisis, uh, this flatness really matters for the global economy. It matters for growth, it matters for, for individual welfare and living standards. The World Bank estimates that if trade, trade today would be 20% higher if we had simply returned to the pre-crisis growth rates. So this, this really matters for constituents, it matters for entrepreneurs. Uh, now, the key research question, we'll try to approach it very simply. As you notice, the paper is pretty short. I will say at 35 years in the private sector, I'm incapable of an academic report. So uh, what you were handed was not an executive summary, it's the report, and I hope you'll find it readable because there's a sub substantial content there because we just wanted to look at what was going on in this high growth period, the, the part of the curve where the, it's pretty steep, and then what's different in the post-crisis period. Well, the pre-period was unique. It, it was uh, unusual in, in the course of uh, an unusual set of factors that were all highly supportive of growth and trade. In fact, it was so unique, we have a name for it, globalization. Globalization gets kicked around a lot as a term, but it is first and foremost a product of technological progress. During this period of time, there were major advances in transport and communication technologies that led to falling costs for the movement of goods, people, ideas, culture, and know-how. This was, had a dramatic effect, similar to the effect beginning about 1870 and lasting till about 2000, 1910, 1870 to 1910. There, the core innovations were steam power and the telegraph, both of which dramatically reduced the costs of moving goods and the cost of coordinating the movement of those goods, so transport and communications. Likewise, in the period 1982 to 2007, you can point to the innovations in containerized shipping, in modern logistics that, was, that influenced the productivity of shipping during that period, and information and communication technology, which had rapidly fallen costs throughout the period as, as producing these kinds of gains. Now, these uh, technological advances spilled over into other areas as well, including uh, global finance. Capital flows became easier to manage, be, moved faster, uh, so there were a whole series of, of, of other effects, some of which I'll get into, some of which I, I'll leave for the report. But, but technology was a key driver during this period. Importantly, policy also improved fairly dramatically uh, to, in the reduction of trade and investment barriers. I'll point to some of the more apparent ones that we list in, in some detail in the report. But here's six or seven large ones. First, economic reforms in China. Keep in mind, at the beginning of this period, China was largely a closed economy, had relatively small exposure to the world. By 2007, the end of the period, China is the second largest exporter on the planet and uh, a huge contributor to the global growth in trade. The second thing that we note is the end of central planning in general, but the fall of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was not in total autarky, but there was relatively little trade between the Soviet Union and the West before 1991, and uh, these newly independent states became quite open to the West and trade increased quite dramatically. Concur concurrent with that was the, form was the formation of the European Union into the, and the advancement into a single market of 1993. In addition, the European Union not just opened its trade within its borders, but it expanded its borders substantially. In 1992, there were 12 members of the European Union. By 2007, the end of this period, uh, there were 27 members. Next, I'd list the Uruguay round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which created the WTO, but also resulted in major tariff reductions and new disciplines in lots of areas of trade. In addition, like the, the EU, the GATT and then WTO expanded its membership rapidly during that period. So not only was it, were the commitments larger, but the coverage through additional members deepened. 
The next thing we point to is the, the expansion of regional trading arrangements. NAFTA we give first and foremost credit to because NAFTA was in many ways, first, it provided deep integration among uh, US, Mexico, and Canada. It tripled trade in North America in the first 10 years. So, so it was, some of that trade growth came from North America. But also, NAFTA was unique and it was the first comprehensive uh, first, att first uh, order attempt at a comprehensive free trade agreement that covered all aspects, both uh, both at the border and behind the border, and, and deepened integration in North America substantially. From the time that NAFTA was entered into force in January 1994 and 2006, an additional 243 regional trading arrangements have been notified to the World Trade Organization. So post-NAFTA, there is a dramatic boost in regional arrangements, and I'll get into it in a moment why that might be. Uh, in addition, we point to bottom-up improvements in, in investment climate. The treatment of foreign capital improved pretty dramatically piece by piece over this time period. When you combine that with the technological gains for global finance, foreign direct investment increased rapidly and helped support these, pr these productive gains in trade. Finally, uh, it's important to recognize deregulation as a component of this. Uh, it's important, telecom gains through technology are one thing. But breaking up Ma Bell probably had as much to do with capturing those gains from the consumer standpoint as anything else. We point out in the report that in 1982, the beginning of this time period we call globalization, a long distance phone call person to person from New York to, to Los Angeles cost a dollar. Those of you in the room with gray hair like me can remember your parents saying, get off the phone, it's long distance. <laughs> okay, versus today's cost of, t of, t of telephone conversations, the marginal cost is basically zero once you own the handset and have the plan. And the cost of, of moving and storing data has fallen precipitously. Uh, so deregulation was a piece of this. Some of the gains in container shipping also came from the deregulation of ocean freight and uh, carriage rates. So uh, all these factors, both policy and uh, and technology combined. One of the outcomes was, in, 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 my, in our view, this, this, this virtuous cycle created a change in the way things were made. So part of the credit to this expansion of trade is, can be seen in what we call global value chains. Global value chains arose for a couple of very simple reasons. First, it was much easier to coordinate tasks across geography than ever before. Second, uh, it was easier to move goods in and out of markets and to, to utilize the abilities and special, uh, special performance characteristics of firms in your, in your supply chain or value chain than it would have been previously. This increased specialization is re by m many firms in the supply chain resulted in what economists call trade in tasks, but actually added immensely to the productivity of individual firms, which showed up in the e economic growth. By the mid to, the, to end of this period, uh, the WTO was writing reports called Made in the World. They called products that are essentially made on planet Earth rather than made in a single location because of the complexity and intricacy of these value chains. Most importantly, trade moved from being a, essentially an arm's length transaction between unrelated parties to almost completely firm directed. UNCTAD in 2014 estimated that 80% of all merchandise trade was firm directed. Now, in my view, this explains the popularity of the regional trading arrangement because cooperating on production, uh, uh, production uh, specialization with your neighbor, the path of least resistance is a regional to trade agreement. And so no wonder it was popular, but once again, you have this virtuous cycle going on, which we hope to recapture in the future of technology improvements like communication and coordination costs falling with policy improvements like regional trading arrangements that benefited consumers and benefited producers. The Ottoman illustration of this, which the report goes into in detail, is the, is the Information Technology Agreement, initiated in 1997. Small category at the time, nobody expected much of it. We created free trade in a sector at the same time that sector was being transformed by what's known as Moore's Law, and where each successive uh, innovative device was faster, cheaper, and, uh, and uh, easier for consumers to, uh, to uh, engage in. As that demand curve flattened out, the growth uh, 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 m multiplied to the point that today the, I the WTO estimates that products covered by the ITA agreement are 10% of global trade. For, for perspective, hydrocarbons are 16% of global trade. So it's a big number. So Now why the slowdown? That's uh, what you came for this morning, what I hope, <laughs> at least. Well, 
uh, a lot of people have looked into this, beginning with the World Bank in their January two th 2015 uh, economic prospects uh, and outlook. Um, there are both cyclical and secular factors. We'll talk about a few of them. Uh, clearly, weak demand was the biggest culprit uh, in this. Uh, keep in mind, the global economy, 65% of import demand comes from advanced economies. When you had advanced economies like the United States slow down dramatically and a slow recovery in the US, Europe, Japan, and other advanced economies, that weak demand is a major factor in the, the slowdown in trade. Second, uh, a cyclical factor not unrelated or not independent of, of demand is trade finance struggled during the post-crisis period. In many ways, banks were uh, needing to focus almost entirely on repairing their balance sheets. And items like trade finance, which are short-term and self-liquidating, often get caught in the credit crunch of that. That clearly happened in the post-crisis period. There are some residual effects of both today. Uh, the U.S. and Western Europe are still, or Europe, excuse me, are still growing far too slowly, below peak performance, and trade finance is still, among, along with other forms of credit, are too restricted versus the pre-period. There are also some secular ch changes. First, as you'd expect with this rapid growth of global value chains and rapid growth of regional trading arrangements, uh, the World Bank points to some marginal technology gains being lower as the global value chains mature. That's not unexpected and we can, the, the, we can probably overcome that. There was also, uh, the Bank of Canada reports a shift in the composition of gross domestic product. If you look at, for, for instance, any economy's gross domestic product and separate investment from consumption from government spending, uh, the trade intensity of investment is actually much higher than consumption and consumption has a higher trade intensity than government spending. And what happened post the crisis due to fiscal uh, stimulus um, uh, efforts in the US and Western Europe, GDP in the big economies shifted from the more trade intensive parts of GDP, like investment, which you saw taper off pretty dramatically, and a boost in government spending, which is simply less trade intensive. So all those are a factor, and probably uh, global demand being the biggest one. But there's another culprit that is worth talking about, because I'm a trade guy and this is important, OK? Protectionism is on the rise. In fact, we've had a complete, since crisis, we've had a complete reversal. We moved away from those great, great liberalizing initiatives of the period of what we call globalization, and we've returned to trade protection in big economies. Uh, it's, it's pretty disappointing. This is a chart that's hard to read from where you are, the, if you want, want a close up look into the report. But basically, uh, the G20 requested that the WTO collect data on the number, on the just numerical trade restrictions enacted and removed by G20 economies. And what you'll see, this, this is basically a visual summary of the WTO's uh, semi-annual reports to the G20. And what you'll see is a creeping uh, addition of, of uh, additional uh, just protective elements and a slower rate, that bottom line is, is the rate of removals of those measures. So even temporary measures, these big economies were very slow to remove them. So overall, the G20 has had three times more discriminatory trade restrictive measures than liberalizing ones, a big change versus the previous period. And uh, about 1,000 new restrictions, as Andrew mentioned, uh, with less than 300 removals cumulatively. Uh, this is not great performance. In fact, the University of Toronto, which publishes a G20 scorecard, they it's a fun document because they basically look at all the promises the leaders of the G20s make to each other, okay, and then say, how well, how well they do deliver them? And the, the, the University of Toronto analyst basically said, trade is the worst of all the promises made by the G20. This is the place where the, there's the furthest gap between promise and, uh, and reality. So to wrap up, what do we do? Well, for me, there are two pretty obvious indicated actions. Um, first, uh, it's important that the, particularly the large developed economies focus on growth. There's a need to restore growth in big economies. The United States at 2% GDP growth is subpar. We need to get growing faster. Europe is, is barely growing at all. It needs to grow faster. Japan needs to grow. Big economies need to look hard at their tax and regulatory policies. They need to look for ways to improve productivity. There are lots of ideas out there. We're not acting on them fast enough. And, and if we really want to return to robust trade growth, we need to return to robust economic growth. Second, and, and uh, I'll conclude there, we have got to get back to trade liberalization. Uh, there's a good, there are good signs in the United States the, it was interesting to note that the, just 
the period of so-called globalization ended coincident with the expiry of trade promotion authority. 2007 was when our research period ended. That's when TPA expired. Uh, it's just been renewed this year. Trade Promotion Authority was renewed by the Congress. We're, we're excited about that. And more importantly, we're excited about the agenda that can be delivered to really improve the terms of trade post the uh, uh, enactment of TPA, both the, uh, uh, the big agreements with uh, the Asia-Pacific economies and the TPP and with Europe and the TTIP, but also uh, the progress in Geneva, the Information Technology Agreement, Part 2. Those kinds of things all help. Uh, so with that, uh, that's our encouragement to, to uh, political leaders and to, uh, and to thinkers around. We'd, we welcome the discussion. And I'd like to turn now into support of that discussion uh, to Ed Gresser. Ed uh, is the special advisor to U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman. Uh, he's a, he's a, a think tank alumnus, ran, a, ran the Progressive Policy Institute for a while and has been one of the best uh, thinkers on trade uh, in Washington for quite some time. We're delighted to welcome Ed here and I'd ask him to, uh, to come, come forward and we'll begin our discussion. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, Ed, welcome. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the first uh, shot of comments on what, what, I've, uh, what Andrew has laid out, what I laid out, and your views on U.S. policy going forward. All right. Well, this is very kind of you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, just as an opening point, um, when I went into think tank work uh, was some time ago, one of the things that I really felt and wanted to kind of use as a guide for my own work was that in um, writing and uh, policy analysis, I felt there was a significant amount of uh, complaining and criticizing and a smaller uh, focus than I would like on providing context and background and explaining the circumstances and environments that governments ought to respond to. And um, this is really a kind of ideal example, I think, of how to approach think tank work, and you know, having a you know, clear vision of what the right policies are and wanting to you know, you know, be clear about what the governments ought to do, but also really taking time to think through the circumstances and trends we see and giving people in government something to think about. Um, so I guess what I would like to do is provide a few reactions and observations and maybe um, complementary thoughts on the, the basic issue and then give a, a little bit of an outline of the administration's policy and what, um, what we're hoping to achieve in, in these coming months. Um, when we think about the circumstances that brought about a, a kind of large and sustained increase in trade flows or trade flows relative to GDP or those sorts of things, um, there are some of them that I think remain active and powerful and are likely to continue. Um, so uh, those in particular involve logistical investment and technological development. For example, um, the deployment of container shipping capacity. Uh, there were in the year 2000 about a capacity of about 4 million TEUs, these are 20 foot equivalent units, the boxes that carry uh, stuff around. Um, in 2009, when President Obama was about to take office, uh, that was at 12.1 million TEUs, and as of last year, 19.9 million TEUs. And you know, each year, the, the growth in the container fleet will be somewhat different, but I, you know, I do think it's not going to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, Likewise, the capacity to move information around the world. Um, every year, there are 10 to 15 new um, submarine cables that go live worldwide. Um, that typically will bring you know, 20 to 30 to 100 million new, new internet users in, into the you know, global telecom network, and typically tends to reduce the cost of moving ideas and information around the world. And again, that is probably going to continue. If you look at, you know, Cisco does a very interesting 
report each year on information flows. And they report that in um, 2000, there were about 0.1 exabytes of data moving around the world per month. And in 2009, it was about 8 exabytes per month. And 2014, about 40. And by 2019, it should be approaching 150. So you know, these are substantial things and substantial contributors to trade growth that will continue to, I think, will continue to remain powerful and influential into the future. Um, second, there are some policy factors that were probably, in some cases, unique to the world of the late 1980s and 1990s and are unlikely to be repeated. Um, two of them in particular. Um, when the Uruguay Round was finished and the WTO was created, the organization had 120 members. Now there are 161. Um, some of the countries or economies that have joined include uh, China, uh, Chinese Taipei, as the WTO phrases it, um, Russia, Vietnam, Saudi Arabia, Ukraine. Um, having negotiated a WTO accession once, they're not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And there are no really large countries still outside the WTO and only a few kind of second tier economies. Um, so that has been one sort of big driver of uh, globalization that is, is probably you know, run its course. Um, likewise, around that time, we wound up with a lot of new countries. Uh, Soviet Union broke up into 15 pieces and Yugoslavia into six. And so, so that a truck moving back and forth from Uzbekistan to Tajikistan in 1990, it was just a truck moving around. In 1992, it was trade. And you know, so you know, okay. the multiplication of countries also <coughs> artificially increased the rate of trade growth mm -hmm. uh, because it converted internal commerce into international commerce. Uh, we don't particularly expect anything like that to happen again. Um, so there are some policy things that we can't count on, and, and that's just going to be life. Uh, third point is that there are some contributing factors to the growth of trade and the uh, decline of the, the rate of trade growth that are a little bit beyond the bounds of policy um, or are second tier effects of policy. For example, between 2000 and 2011, about a third of all world export growth was in natural resources, uh, particularly energy and oil, um, that, but also mining and metal ores. That um, sharply pushed up the rate of trade growth. And in the, in the last few years, we've seen that um, go into reverse. In the US, for example, if you compare our likely trade import figures in 2015 to those of 2011, our imports of natural gas and oil will be off probably by about $260 billion. Mm -hmm. That is as much as all of the clothes and all the cars we buy in a year from abroad. Um, and that largely reflects two things. One is the reaction of American domestic <coughs> industry to high prices. It began digging up more, more stuff. And two, um, the uh, effect of slowing growth in China. Um, that has driven down the, the cost of uh, energy from $140 per barrel to 47 I think it was yesterday. Uh, driven down the cost of copper from $4.40 per pound to about $2.20. Driven down the cost of iron ore from about, I think, $150 per ton to maybe $60 per ton. And so there are pr big pricing effects in natural resource trade that uh, are effects of diminished demand, but they're not really effects of trade policy per se, and we can't really expect trade policy to turn them around, and nor really should we expect trade policy to fulfill a role like that. So having, having said that, um, there are some objective reasons, I think, for the slowdown in trade growth that we can look at analytically, but we probably shouldn't be overly concerned about. Having said that, there are also some good reasons for concern, both for the US as a, a national economy, where the administration has placed a lot of emphasis, and correctly so, on improving our export performance as a key to a, a period of growth that's based on investment and research and production and so forth. Uh, very su successful from 2009 to 2014. Uh, this year, our own trade figures are off. Um, 
and uh, we're looking for ways to deal with that. And let me mention um, three in particular that, you know, in general are quite consistent with the recommendations that Scott and uh, Daniel have been giving. One, looking at the growth in the number of um, protectionist actions or discriminatory actions and so forth. One of the administration's major trade initiatives, which has not uh, got as much attention maybe as we'd like it to, is the creation of the IETEC, um, our enforcement body. This has substantially increased the ability of the administration to do research on trade restrictive measures and potential violations of agreements um, using you know, primary source material in Korean and in Indonesian and you know, foreign language material. So we can do a lot of our own research and evaluation of areas where we should concentrate our enforcement efforts. Two, um, we have, I think, made some significant progress at the WTO. The conclusion of the trade facilitation agreement last year was the, was the first fully multilateral agreement in the WTO's history and the first WTO agreement really since 1998, I believe, when we had the uh, basic telecommunications agreement. That has been followed by the um, likely conclusion of the information technology agreement and some substantial progress on environmental goods agreement. So we do have, you know, I think we're beginning to sort of chart out a path that the WTO can follow. And, Relatively smaller agreements than, WTO, than, the, than a comprehensive round, but significant ones that deal with large traded sectors and provide a lot of benefit. Third, and um, obviously this is a, the center of our work right now, we have several very large uh, agreements in train. Uh, we are working hard on the final elements of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This has been very much bolstered by the approval of Trade Promotion Authority, which has given us both the procedural um, features of TPA, and also kind of marching orders in the sense of bipartisan negotiating objectives in which Congress is telling us, here's what uh, we expect this to look like. Mm -hmm. So we will work hard on that in the coming weeks. And looking a bit further forward, you know, working equally as hard on the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, and are likely, I think, to leave to the next administration a number of years of trade promotion authority, and a set of options, both with in regional agreements and multilaterally, that I, I think can be the basis for a pretty uh, sustained period of trade policy achievement. And you know, in all of this work, we rely on ideas and advice, and are very grateful to CSAS and to Scott for providing us with this research paper, because it really is very thought-provoking very informative, um, tells you a lot about trade and how it works and why it works in a, in a quite short um, uh, span of paper. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Scott. Thank you, Ed. And then now we'd like to open to your questions, so which I, we hope we've stimulated a few. Uh, three, uh, three rules for questions here, but before we get started, first, wait for the microphone. Uh, we do have an online audience, and uh, uh, this will be part of our uh, csas.org uh, uh, webcasts, so uh, no one will hear you if you don't have a microphone. Second, uh, when you get the microphone, uh, uh, introduce yourself and, and your organization. Uh, and third, uh, make sure your question's in the form of a question. So uh, with that, uh, we'd be w welcome uh, your, your ideas. Dan, yes. Yeah, I thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dan O'Flaherty with the National Foreign Trade Council. Scott, you and, and Ed, to a somewhat lesser extent, have uh, correctly identified the sluggish uh, growth of demand in uh, developed economies as a key factor here. One of the major components, of course, of, of demand is incomes. Right. And uh, incomes have been relatively flat. Uh, so, I wonder to what extent your uh, research and your report took into account uh, job growth, income growth as a factor in slowdown in trade? It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, the, the principal factor in the slowdown is weak aggregate, aggregate demand, uh, particularly in, in, the, in the large uh, developed economies, which, which constitute the majority of import demand. Uh, so so that, that is a key factor. And, some of it is just the nature of the crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, 
the people at the IMF and elsewhere will tell you that a banking crisis usually buys you three to five years of really crummy economic growth. It's just the nature of it. It's it, you know we used to call it stagflation or whatever it might be, uh, but but it really there there are there are sort of persistent effects of, of banking crises that make them dif different in some ways than cyclical recessions, for instance. So uh, the fact that we had a big banking crisis in 2008, 2009 is a key component. Now, uh, what we're left with, though, is while the economy has slowly recovered, the U.S. economy, take it as the key example, it is still growing at a rate that top-line economic growth is well below what we had achieved in the previous 10 or 15 years. And we're well below what most think it are, is what we're capable of doing. For instance, while headline, uh, headline unemployment has reached just a shade over 5%, if you look at labor force participation, labor force participation is the lowest it's been in 30 years. So there, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done to raise economic performance. And I would, I would point to, you know, there's, there's not a big initiative in tax policy. I mean, uh, other, than, other than, you know, Paul Ryan, who is one of the hardest working, most sophisticated members of, of the United States Congress, has some, has some big ideas about tax reform. We haven't done tax reform in the United States since 1986, and I usually point out to people, uh, party politics aside, in 1986, the best place in the world to locate a business was the United States. Okay, we were far and above anybody else in the incentives to capital formation and, and starting, expanding, and growing a business. Okay, uh, what happened is since from 1986 to today, the rest of the world figured out what we did, took action, and we stood still. So I, I think there's a big opportunity uh, in tax reform. There's a big opportunity in regulatory reform. We, we are, uh, we've, we've gotten in the habit of, of, of uh, largely ignoring the costs of regulation. They do have a cost, they do have a burden. We have relatively poor small business formation, which in some ways I think is attributable both to slow growth but also the regulatory hurdles that they face. We're the, the first time in decades, uh, fewer, more small businesses are closing than opening. Uh, in the United States. That's, uh, that's the wrong trend. Uh, there's uh, also, I would note, productivity. Productivity growth has slowed in the United States and Europe. Uh, there's a new, very important report uh, by the, from the OECD called the Future of Productivity. It deserves the attention of all the policymakers. So those three factors, I do think you're right to say top line uh, global uh, aggregate demand is one of the key problems, but there are solutions that we're not really paying much attention to uh, that deserve attention. Yes. Yes, sir. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ed Barber from GoodWorks International, a consultancy founded by Andy Young. I wanted to ask about the place of labor and the unions in all of this. Uh, the unions, of course, look at trade liberalization as a cause of greater income inequality, loss of jobs, migration of jobs to, to Mexico, and so on. Typically those of us who are in favor of trade liberalization would say it raises incomes, although it creates winners and losers. Um, but that's cold comfort if you're out of a job. <laughs> you're a loser. Okay. Is there anything in these changed circumstances that allows, that might allow us to make an argument that could possibly return labor to their historic position as supporters of trade liberalization, or are we doomed to uh, be at odds there indefinitely? I'll, I'll comment, but also uh, want, want to hear from Ed on this because uh, I think Ed and the uh, Obama administration uh, took great lengths to, uh, to 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 consult with and incorporate the views of at least organized labor uh, in the recent round of uh, trade promotion authority. And I, I think it's it, there, he'll, he'll be able to comment on the payoff. I would note a couple of things. Uh, first, that um, that today's uh, workers are core to the production of any good or service in the United States. So workers are an important part of the equation. Uh, in terms of manufacturing employment per se, uh, the biggest effect here is not so much trade as productivity gains. Uh, I believe the, the, the numbers are, the last I saw the calculation, if we had today's economic manufacturing output with the productivity of 10 years ago, there'll be 2 million more people working in the manufacturing sector. So productivity gains have, have uh, which have which have been 
penetrating the manufacturing industry since really the end of World War II and, and have, have resulted in the situation where we have very high manufacturing output, that record high last year, and yet falling employment since about the, sometime in the 1960s in, in the manufacturing sector. Same thing happened in agriculture a century before. Uh, so so this, is, this is not unusual. And it is, it, I, I do note that while technological change is fascinating, most industries that wind up as, as industries uh, on the sunset of technology at one time were the hot new thing. I mean, the auto industry in 1915 to 1940 was, uh, was, was, uh, was an amazing source of technological improvement, much as uh, sort of the, uh, the today's, today's a Apple or Facebook. That was what the auto industry was in that period of time. So almost any, any industry goes through cycles like that. Uh, look, um, the, the, uh, it, is, it is very important for people to be able to contribute productively to, to what we're doing. Uh, in, in this society. And in my view, the missing piece here is, is, that, uh, is that in a rapidly changing uh, uh, demand economy where technology is driving the changes, it's finding ways to renew people's talents and to improve skill levels as the demand for skills changes in economy where we don't do as good a job as we should. We've got systems and processes set up as if the economy is somewhat, uh, somewhat uh, stable in terms of its employment opportunities, that these are static. And, uh, and that may have been true at some point in time. It is certainly not true today. And so there's a dynamic effect here that I don't think we're accounting for as well. In addition, sometimes U.S. barriers to trade uh, or U.S. policies create job losses not due to foreign competition. I would note that uh, the great Donald Trump uh, likes to pick on Oreo cookies moving a plant from, uh, from uh, Chicago to Mexico, uh, but his staff forgot to tell him that the leading ingredient of the Oreo cookies is sugar, and sugar is twice the price in the U.S. that it is in Mexico because of U.S. government policy. So there's a lot we can do on the policy front uh, in addition to uh, things, things that would improve workforce skill and adaptation to modern environment. A couple of uh, kind of factual thoughts and a couple of policy points. Um, one, uh, on the employment question, the last few years have actually been fairly good ones for factory workers. Um, from 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, each year we've had a, a net gain in manufacturing employment. Um, that is the first time that's happened since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are up in 2015 over the level of 2014. And if that extends through the end of the year, we would have six full years of um, factory job growth, which would be the first time since the 1960s. And it would be the second longest period of uninterrupted factory job growth since the year 1900 in the yeah. history of the BLS. So it's not a huge amount of numbers, but it is a strong and steady and sustained performance that I think um, the administration feels good about and that mm -hmm. people generally should feel good about. Yes. Um, second, in terms of um, competition, we live in a world where the US economy is naturally becoming a little bit more open year by year. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody is going to turn off the internet. Container shipping is not going to be uninvent uninvented. The costs of transport of goods and the cost of moving information are probably going to diminish a little bit each year. And you know, given our membership in the WTO and our tariff bindings, you know, that's the world we live in. And you know, we look at say competition with Vietnam. You know, TPP. Sometimes they, people say this is going to force us to compete with Vietnamese workers. Well, what does Vietnam make? Um, the biggest things they're sending us are cell phones, and uh, laptop computers, and fish, and toys, and so on and so forth. Most of those are zero tariff products. You know, that, and so we compete already. It's the world we live in. The question is, how, you know, what do we do about it? Do we give American workers and American-based businesses? as much opportunity as we can to sell abroad? Do we accompany trade agreements with strong trade adjustment assistance programs? Those are commitments the administration has made and generally is following through on. The TPP in particular is, uh, con you know, contains a lot of the hopes and objectives that labor activists have had over the years. It will have um, enforceable labor standards based on the ILO, fully in, you know, in the core text of the agreement. 
enforceable by the same means as all the other objectives. It will have a strong set of commitments to um, acceptable conditions of work. So we think um, this, uh, what the um, TPP is like and what you know, is, stands up very well in terms of encouraging good conditions for workers, high quality jobs, promoting employment here, and is balanced with the Good Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. As to how various people react to it, it you know, that's, uh, it's up to them, really. Just a further comment on Ed's example of, uh, of Vietnam in the, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. He made it the point that a lot of the things that Vietnam currently imports are already zero duty or duty free, like products covered by the Information Technology Agreement. The other piece of this is the things we sell to Vietnam often face relatively high tariffs. So because Vietnam, we have an MFN trade relations. We don't have a preferential agreement with Vietnam of any sort. The Trans-Pacific Partnership actually is quite a win for U.S. exporters because the terms of trade from the U.S. exporting to Vietnam will improve substantially. There will be some improvement on terms of trade for Vietnam to the United States, but I think the big gains there, given uh, Vietnam still has relatively high tariffs. This is a very trade. good point. Um, um, for an automobile, a uh, U.S. tariff is 2.5%, and the Vietnamese tariff is 70%. 17. No, 7 zero. 7 zero. Uh, For a, uh, a, a can of mushrooms, I believe we're at 11%, and Vietnam is about 35%. Um, you know, so there are quite a, you know, a lot of areas where the U.S. is fairly open or entirely open, and significant areas where Vietnam and uh, Malaysia and our other partners are not. Uh, one other example, even in the case of uh, New Zealand, um, not a closed economy, no. you know, yeah. strong leader in the WTO, all those sorts of things. Uh, our trade with Vietnam in goods is about balanced, about 4.2 billion in American exports to New Zealand and about 4 billion point zero coming in. We are collecting $35 million a year on the New Zealand goods, and they're collecting $85 million a year on the American goods. So even there, there's, you know, there's a, a skew. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, Bill Lane with uh, Caterpillar. Um, always enjoy, I mean, Scott through his entire career has always been forward leaning and always has some great insights into the future. Ed, you literally wrote the book on trade, and it's a good book, uh, <laughs> which everyone should buy at least a copy or two at Christmas time. Um, but, but I do have a question as far as what's coming next. Um, you know, TPP and uh, TTIP and what have you are, are clearly on the agenda, and, and that's a, they're major strides forward. But traditionally, there's always been a country or two that we've sort of embraced as far as a traditional bilateral free trade agreement. And we've had meetings around town off and on where people say, what would be a good candidate? And Scott, I remember you one time suggested Indonesia. And by the end of three minutes, everybody in the room was saying Indonesia. Are there two or three countries that you would put on your hip parade as far as what the next president should look at should they decide to go back to the traditional bilateral free trade route? Well, um, I think that's a little more than I'm willing to take on. And that, <laughs> uh, but I will say, one, one thing, assuming we are successful in <coughs> completing TPP, TPP is built as an agreement that can accommodate new members. We have had expressions of interest from Korea, for example, and from the Philippines. Um, next administration will have, I believe, four and a half years of trade promotion authority. Mm -hmm. um, if we are, you know, if we bring in the bring the trade facilitation agreement into force. This is something actually quite important. We need to get 108 WTO members to ratify it, and we now have 16. Um, so we have to do quite a bit of work on that. Uh, so, uh, but I do think the next administration will have some options about mm -hmm. you know, multilateral options, uh, TPP-based options. Perhaps they'll think about bilateral FTAs. We are trying to think through a bit about how do we use the 10 years of AGOA to sort of think through the future trade relationship with Africa. Um, so there, there are a lot of things we could think about. And you know, I think rather than having me suggest ideas, it would be good to have ideas coming to us. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think for for me, the, the 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 immediate opportunity is an expansion. Let's 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 presume we're going to we're going to successfully conclude the Trans Pacific Partnership. Uh, for me, nothing succeeds like success first. Uh, so w once you get an agreement like that, people will want to c contemplate joining. We ought to, uh, the na uh, this or the next administration should encourage that. But second, regionally, uh, the fastest growing part of the world, the place where the world's middle class is going to be, uh, is, uh, is the Asia Pacific. And so I would be looking for ways to expand the TPP into, first the economies that are interested, like Korea, like uh, Philippines, like Taiwan. Uh, but also to the other big, important economies of the region, many of whom have gone backwards since the crisis. Indonesia would still be at the top of my list because it's well over 200 million people. It, is, it, had, it has had important growth over the past 20 years uh, in terms of, uh, of a very steady improvement in living conditions, but is about to be caught in a trap of protectionism and, and could, could really use integration with both the rest of Asia and with countries like the United States and Japan, advanced economies that are going to buy a lot of the output. So, so I would, my, my first, uh, my first uh, act would be uh, getting TPP to be a, a true Asia Pacific economy. So this question up here and then one in the back. So. Thank you. Uh, Matt, <clears throat> excuse me, Matt Benjamin, Medley Advisors. Uh, on TPP uh, timing, the ministerial meeting, do we expect that to come before or after the Canadian elections? I think those are October 19, which are critical, I think, to, to mm -hmm. what happens with TPP. <clears throat> Excuse me. And second of all, uh, if TPP drags out into early next year, which seems increasingly possible, uh, do either do, – do, what are both of your thoughts on how the uh, U.S. presidential and congressional elections may complicate – Mm -hmm. Approval of it. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, you want to speculate or you want me to? <laughs> ministerial time not set yet. Um, conclusion depends on the quality of the agreement. Politics way over my head. <laughs> I would, uh, well, I, first, I, I think the political commitment to conclude TPP is overwhelming. So I think it will conclude. Uh, probably this fall, um, I, I would look at. Uh, I've, I have said for about six months now that the APEC leaders meeting looks to me to be the, uh, the, the uh, most likely signing ceremony. <laughs> so uh, so I, I think they'll make progress this fall, and I, I do think the Canadian elections will be a factor uh, in timing but not outcome. Uh, in terms of, of congressional action on it, uh, the best analogy would be the year 2000. In the year 2000, we had a Democratic president in the last of a year of his second term. We had a uh, relatively strongly contested election. We had a Republican House and a Republican Senate. We also had a highly controversial trade issue before the Congress. It was China permanent normal trade relations. Uh, and uh, this was a case we didn't even have fast track. There was no required procedures for acting on it. Uh, and we got a situation where in the spring of 2000, the year 2000, the House passed a bill, the Senate passed that same bill without amendment. Imagine that happening today. <laughs> okay. And the President signed it. So I do think there's room in the spring. Uh, if I look at the primary calendar, uh, there's the Super Tuesday and then I think what they're calling the SEC primary, uh, the multiple southern states, which will, at that point will probably know the nominee of both parties. Uh, so that would seem to me to be a, enough primaries passed uh, to get this in a similar situation as it was where we knew Al Gore and George W. Bush were the two nominees in, in 2000, at which time Congress can act. I also look at TPP as something that has real benefits to American exporters. There is going to be some good news in TPP for companies to, to, to uh, inform their members of Congress about and communicate to the American people. So I, 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 I think we had a difficult vote, a close vote on uh, on, trans on trade promotion authority, although it passed by one vote in 2011 and 2015. Uh, so that's a big improvement in, in terms of the House. So uh, uh, these kinds of things I think are, are possible and I think would be good management, uh, but I, I do think there's political room for it. And I, we won't ask Ed to speculate. There's a question here, a question in the back, and that's probably what we can handle in the time, so in, in, in either order. Thanks. Well, actually, uh, two questions, Jean-François Boitin. Uh, first question on your first graph of your very good presentation. Congratulations, Scott. 
Uh, are we seeing a return to normal, i.e., where the 25 years uh, mm -hmm. between 85, 84, and 2007 an exception? Uh, or to put it in abstract terms, how long can we expect yeah. trade to go twice as fast as output? Right, good question. And the second question is, um, isn't there a change in the intellectual landscape as we got globalization? Uh, if you uh, look at uh, everything that has been written and said about the renaissance of manufacturing mm -hmm. in this country, uh, isn't that in some ways going a little back sure. on globalization because you hear a lot of industries saying we have too much of it, also in terms of too long delays in the global value chain and so on, so we need to make things here also. Right. And that does not come only from labor. Okay, good, good questions. On the natural rate of growth of trade, uh, the, the World Bank actually looked at this, and there's a small table in the report that you'll find. The World Bank looked at like 15-year time periods, and first, trade almost always grows faster than output. Uh, in the 15 years before globalization really kicked in, it grew at 1.7. So you had 1.7% growth in trade for every 1% point growth, 1 growth in output. So the, the, the factor was 1.7. Uh, during the peak of globalization, the factor was 2.2. And then in, in the most recent 15 years, it slowed again, including the Great Recession, to 1.7. So uh, I, I think, so my answer would be, yeah, there were some extraordinary factors in the, pre, in the period of globalization. But second, we should not be satisfied with trade growing at only the rate of output. That's a failure in my book. And it's hist it would return us to a period of history like 1914 to, 19, to 1945 or so when trade declined radically. I mean, 1913 was a year of peak trade, by the way. Okay, and then the world collapsed and it took us a long time to return to those levels. So uh, that, that, I think that that's the first question. In terms of the manufacturing renaissance, I don't know how much to make of it other than there has been a great resorting of global economies um, in pre and, and post the Great Recession. And that has caused some of these effects. So the moderating uh, income growth in the United States has actually fostered uh, manufacturing. Likewise, many, a lot of the manufacturing that found its way into China is now facing much higher labor costs, much higher uh, coordination costs, things like that, as, just simply as China has grown and demand for labor has increased, and things like that. So there's some resettling. And uh, to be honest, I haven't looked at enough data to, to have a conclusive answer. Uh, for you. But, uh, but I do think s trade growth only growing as fast as GDP would be a major failure based on history. So uh, final question in the back. Uh, yes. Don Manzullo from the Korea Economic Institute. One of the prom uh, first of all, I like the title. It didn't say what caused the global trade down, but what, what prompted it, <laughs> which is, uh, it, 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 I think it's, it's a more honest view of it because Thank you're you. looking at the big picture. Uh, but on the, uh, on the decrease in productivity, the studies are all done normally in terms of, of, of human capability. Mm -hmm. But when you have a situation such as today where diesel trucks burn 50% less fuel right. than they did five years ago, uh, including Bill Lane's Caterpillar engines mm -hmm. uh, that generate electricity, the overall demand of, of natural resources uh, is down because of the increased efficiency. Yes. Uh, and, and that doesn't get figured into anything. And it also spills over to the fact that Americans uh, are really driving less yes. now. The cars are getting better mileage. Less money is coming in uh, for the highway uh, trust fund. Yeah. And there's a lot less construction going on in the country that has 50% of its bridges uh, in the process of crumbling within the next 30 to 40 years. Yes. So the, 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 it's actually the increase in productivity uh, in, in machinery that could be one of the prompts for the yes. global trade uh, slowdown, and I'd like your view on that. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a good point, and, and I think first from a normative standpoint, 
you're, you're making an important point, which is not all reductions in demand are bad. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sometimes sometimes if things like efficiency improvements uh, uh, are actually quite good for the economy, although we we, we tend to score them as bad. So I I, I think you're make, making an important point, uh, and certainly that particularly with regard to energy utilization and things that are very energy intensive. That would be transportation, but also agriculture. Agriculture prices uh, about, if you were trying to predict ag prices, about 8% of the predictive value would be in, in the, whatever your futures were for energy prices. So there, there's a, energy affects a lot of the economy, uh, whether, you, whether it's standing still or moving. Uh, and so uh, the, the lowered energy prices uh, have had a, an important effect on the economy, and one that would normally sort of depress the gross calculations, uh, which I think, I think is correct. I do think we need to adjust for a different energy future. All right, we have, we have a lot of policies that were based on, we, have, we have, still have a crude, a crude oil export ban that's 30 years old. Uh, and yet we are currently the largest producer of hydrocarbons in the world. We, we don't, we, it, we're reflecting an, an energy crisis mentality when in fact we have great energy abundance in the United States. So there's, there's a lot of room for policy to catch up, whether that's the way we calculate the highway trust fund, and the way we tax uh, uh, users for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for highways, uh, but also some, some very basic elements of our own uh, national policy of how we think of ourselves as a, as a resource uh, uh, creator here in the United States. So I think your point is well taken. Uh, and uh, what's important to me is really looking to the future, how we restore growth in both output and trade. But thank you for your comments. And I'm sorry to report we're out of time, but I do want to thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. And uh, particularly want to thank Ed for uh, taking time out of his schedule to both read and uh, report a thoughtful comment on it, but also to be here this morning. So thank you. Have a great day.